Hello, my name is Liam Mason and I'm a PhD student from the University of Lincoln in the UK. And on behalf of myself and my co-authors, Catherine Gerlin, Patrick Dickerson, UC Holopainen, Kieran Hicks and Lisa Jacobs, I'm presenting our paper, including the experience of physically disabled players in mainstream guidelines for movement-based games. Our work is built upon three main points. Firstly, movement-based games offer opportunities for physically engaging play, providing a wide range of benefits. Current guidelines are either too abstract or focus on the experience of non-disabled players, not considering the impact that bodily differences may have on play experience. And lastly, movement-based play for disabled players is viewed as a therapeutic intervention, prioritising medicalised views on disability and health outcomes. Building our work around two research questions. How does physical disability need to be accounted for in movement-based games? And how do guidelines need to be adjusted to include physically disabled players? Our work mainly focuses on Muella and Espista's movement-based guidelines. So I'll quickly cover these now before diving into the study and findings of our work. Their work covers three broad categories. Movement requires special feedback. Movement leads to bodily changes and movement emphasizes certain kinds of fun. From our perspective, we consider these guidelines as a primary reference point for the creation of enjoyable movement-based games. However, like other work seeking to guide the development of enjoyable movement-based games, these guidelines do not consider diversity among players' bodies, nor players who might have different needs and perspectives on physical play. Our work thus seeks to bridge the gap between these recommendations provide supplementary considerations which can be used to guide the design of movement-based games which are accessible to disabled players and emphasize engaging positive play experiences over therapeutic outcomes. In our work, we present a two-part study which explores the perspectives of people with physical disabilities on movement-based games. We used a set of game concepts as conversation starters and prompts for both parts. Design concepts, for example, paper prototypes, have previously been used to engage research participants in conversations about design requirements. In the case of games, they can foster exchange between designers and players who are given a reference point for reflection. We created our concepts in a three-hour design workshop involving six designers, the aim of which was to create game ideas encompassing a wide variety of game mechanics, controls, and interactions suitable for physical disabled players. Eight final concepts were selected. For each, we created a short demonstration video, textual description, and graphical rep representations of the game and physical player input. Demonstration videos included a 20 to 60 second video mock-up of gameplay footage, accompanied by a video insert of a player performing the movements that would control the game. A quick overview of one concept is Kung Fu Skateboarding, a single player endless runner game where the player controls a skateboarder who is constantly moving forward on a road filled with hazards. The core gameplay is similar to many runner games, such as Temple Run, but in this instance, colliding with a hazard will not kill the player, but instead momentarily slow them down. The game uses several different gestures in a combination with wheelchair movement for game control. A conversation goal for Kung Fu Skateboarding was to encourage participants to reflect on the consequences of making mistakes in movement-based games, for example, a loss of time when colliding with a, with a game object. We designed semi-structured interviews around physical activity, gaming, and our concepts. The goal of this step of our research was to provide an in-depth exploration on the perspectives of physical disabled people on movement-based games. The interviews were carried out in two steps, covering demographic information and individual background of participants, covering perspectives on physical activity and experience with movement-based games, and secondly, reflections on physical activity and movement-based play with our game concepts. We had six participants in total, four male, two female, aged between 19 and 61 years of age. Data was analysed using Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis, IPA, a qualitative approach that aims to provide detailed examinations of personal lived experiences. To supplement our findings, we conducted an online survey with 21 respondents that included participation from a broader group of respondents in an effort to avoid missing important groups in our work. Qualitative data was analyzed using inductive thematic analysis, while quantitative 
was analyzed using SPSS. Our analysis led to three key findings. Firstly, meaningful individual adaptation that allows players to adjust interaction paradigms and in-game challenges to their needs. For example, players might struggle with specific movements and giving them an opportunity to replace them with something more suitable would be highly beneficial. Secondly, our, sh our results show that social play is not universally positive. With disabled people recounting instances of being physically active that were stigmatizing rather than empowering. And lastly, movement-based games need to be engaging first and physically challenging second, suggesting that they would like to see play prioritized over exertion. And that this approach offers the opportunity of masking physical activity, which is something perceived as uncomfortable. We draw from our findings to review and contextualize the movement-based guidelines discussed earlier. For each guideline in our paper, we include our own commentary and how they do or do not address the needs and preferences of physically disabled people, and how they need to be interpreted in the context of physical disability. For the basis of time constraints, in this presentation we will give one example. For the full list, please check out our paper. For example, facilitate social fun. Our results suggest that the notion of social fun needs to be carefully addressed. While the movement-based guidelines suggest to turn the game into a spectacle for others to enjoy watching, physically disabled participants reported that being physically active in the presence of others was uncomfortable, exactly because of being viewed as a spectacle. However, participants did point out that they would be interested in playing with others, such as family and friends. In conclusion, we reject the initial call of the authors to make the game a spectacle. Instead, prioritizing players' comfort zones and facilitating optional social fun that does not turn a disability into a spectacle. In conclusion, movement-based games offer an opportunity for physical activity and our work makes a contribution towards ensuring accessibility of such systems for disabled players, not just on a level of basic system access, but also in terms of engaging play experiences. We highlight how existing recommendations for design of movement-based games for non-disabled players needs to be adjusted to also take into account the needs and preferences of physically disabled players. Here our work said that the first step towards identifying game features and mechanics that need to be designed with more nuance when wishing to include physically disabled players in mainstream movement-based play.